Okay, I think we are recording now. So I think the first question you shared with me was, um, hope oh, uh, I think you stopped sharing. Oh, okay. Let me go share my screen real quick. Okay. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I was ever sharing in the first place. Okay, let's see if that works. There you go. I'm good. Okay. So, what is it? The IJF entry of. Okay, so RAB. Okay, so my whiteboard is in the background, but uh, I'll move it aside. I'm just kind of copying the problem over. Uh, I don't have my usual desktop set up, so I have to be conservative with my screen real estate. So, what is this? Like proving RAB is equal to like. R, A, B, or something like this. Yeah, it has to do with like certain things don't. When you multiply them together, they don't equal each other. It doesn't work. Like I think it's associative. Well, hold on. Is what it's supposed to be trying to do for a uh, <clears throat> for a scalar like R, it should work exactly as you would hope. I believe. Uh, like it's more or less you're trying to prove something like this. Oh wait, uh, what is it like? What what are the three things? Um, you there? Yeah. Uh, uh, it, what does this look like? Uh, where where's the R? I don't have the well. Maybe I do have the textbook in front of me. I'm I'm uh I'm gonna pull up the full. Sure. Uh, I mean, I just need the statement of the problem, right? It's or I could maybe just do one example. But I'll talk while I go ahead. And the idea here is basically just to show that the, you know, the IJ the arbitrary IJ element of each one of these ends up being the exact same thing, right? That's the that's the idea here. Um. Ugh, okay. Which section was this? Two point one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's page one thirty seven. One thirty seven. Yeah. That's the page where the problem is on? Uh, on the, like, the documents. On the documents. Uh, it's in the textment, and the textbook is 109. Okay, 109, gotcha. 109, here we go. Okay, and then uh, where is the source theorem itself? It is on page one oh six. I think it's that one. Five. One oh five. Uh which one of these am I looking at? Can you see my screen still? Can you see my screen still? Yeah, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth. I don't have dual monitors either. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really hate it when they <laughs> when they don't explicitly copy a thing over. Uh, here we go. R A B. Okay, gotcha. So it was the funny version. Here we go. The B associated with the uh, the R associated with the B was the last one I was missing. All right. So can you see my screen now? My whiteboard. Yes. Yeah. So um, these are all n by n matrices, right? Or whatever they, I don't think they necessarily even need to be. But yeah. what they, the hint that they give you basically is that the IJ entry in the IJ entry in this thing is R A I 1 B 1 J, right? And then they just sort of Your, have these parentheses. Uh, yeah, I know it's kind of, I know it's getting cut off. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to flip through best I can, right? B two J something like this, right? Plus dot 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 all the way up to R A I N B is it N J? And the idea here is that because scalar, like because matrix multiplication uh, ends up being like for each I J element, it's for each I J element it becomes like a regular multiplication and addition, right? The idea is that because you get the associative property from regular, like high school or middle school or elementary school operations, you can just basically move things around as you please, right? So like, 
because I, you know, I'm familiar with the associative property from middle school, I can rearrange this to write it like this. Yeah. Because it's going to be the same thing. Yeah. Right. So. Exactly. Right. This is, uh, you know, if we take out the linear algebra part and just focus on the, uh, uh, focus on the part from, uh, <laughs> from like middle school, right. We can rewrite, you know, these are all just genuine, genuine, uh, real numbers. And we can rearrange this as we please. And also if we wanted to rearrange it, we could, you know, attach the R with a B and put the parentheses that way. Yeah. So, you know, for example, once I rewrite it like this, this is basically just the ij represent ij elements of this matrix. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's like really all there is to say for this one. It just comes down to showing this associative property of scalars by zooming in uh, to a you know more fine grain view of the ij element. And because these properties are true for the IJ element, you can then sort of zoom back out, you know, do your manipulation and then zoom back out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like mm -hmm. this was the informal way of doing it where I just erased the parentheses and moved the R around. If you wanted to do it, you would probably write that like, you know, write the, the you know, write the original line and then, you know, rearrange it as the ne next line saying that, you know, the previous line is equal to the next line. But hopefully this gets the idea across. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm so right. bad when you write it. Like that. Remind me the next one that you wanted to look at. Ah, uh, was it about the invertible things? B minus C. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good one. This is a really good one. Uh, so again, it's a little bit hard because I don't have the uh, statement of the. My screen isn't big enough to have the statement of the problem. Uh, well, actually, maybe it is. Okay. So given that these are all matrices, right? B minus C times d is equal to zero, and it's understood that these are matrices. Uh, so b and c are m by n, and d is invertible. Show that b is equal to c. What kind of intuition do you have for this problem? What kind of thoughts do you have so far? Some One of the matrices has to be a, like a zero thing. Yeah, so like either this piece or this piece has got to be zero is kind of the feeling that you get, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking about how to explain. No, it's good intuition. So I was going to say, like, if this is the linear algebra uh, version of the problem, I sometimes like to draw a comparison to regular middle school algebra, right? Just regular old algebra. So I'm going to represent that with lowercase, uh, lowercase variables to show the analogy. So if this was uh, middle school and you said that B minus C times D is equal to zero, then you would say that either B minus C is equal to zero or D is equal to zero, right? right? It could be true that they're both, but at least one, like this is a logical or in the math mathematical sense, at least one of these must be true in middle school algebra, right? Right. Now, if I told you that, uh, D is non-zero. Now, if we just told, if the problem just told you that D, <laughs> sorry, my handwriting is terrible. Like, if the problem told you D is uh, D is not equal to zero, well, then this possibility is eliminated. So then, this must be true, and therefore, you can conclude that B is equal to C, right? This is this would be the the middle school algebra analogy. So this sort of leads us to a sort of similar line of thinking where, let me know if this intuition is new to you, but in linear algebra, I'm going to make my screen bigger, by the way. Sorry, just one second. Uh, going to make that bigger. Okay, so in, um, what was I saying? In linear algebra, a matrix D being invertible Whoa, what is happening? A matrix D being invertible is kind of the linear algebra equivalent of saying that something is non-zero. Are you familiar with this intuition? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yes. 
Very good. Very good. Well, then... Well, then... Okay. Well, then we should be really close to solving the problem now. Because... Now, if we, we were... We what's up? D can't be zero? Uh, yeah. I mean, if we're told that D can't be zero, right? Like, uh, in regular algebra, right? How would you, how would you solve this step by step? If you told that D is not equal to zero, then you could divide by both sides, right? Just divide by D and then divide by D to get rid of it. So now you just get right. B minus C is equal to zero, so B is equal to C. So this is just a two-step problem. Divide by D and then just, you know, move to the other side. So then in linear algebra, rather than, uh, quote, dividing by lowercase d, what can we do with this uppercase d matrix, no, no, given that we know that it's invertible? Do you not just, you can't divide matrices like that? You can't, or The terminology is a little bit weird, because we don't, like, we try to avoid the term dividing by a matrix. What do we call it instead? Just inverting it? Yes, exactly. Multiplying by the inverse, right? We multiply by the inverse so that, uh, let me just rewrite this. So if we basically right multiply both sides by D's inverse, which is guaranteed to exist uh, because D is invertible. So D times D inverse, this is just one, and zero times D inverse, this is just still just zero. So this shows us that B minus C is equal to zero, and then you can finish the rest yourself. Gotcha. Right? So, like, okay. I, it seems like the teacher, or maybe at some point, you've come across this, like, analogy between uh, capital D being invertible and lowercase d being non-zero, but the sort of, like, thing that, like, this kind of motivates how to solve this problem, because it, whereas you would just divide by d in regular algebra, now you can do a similar operation with capital D matrix to sort of get rid of it, so to speak. Right? Um, but, and, but this wouldn't necessarily work if we didn't have the guarantee that D was invertible. Um, because then you couldn't get rid of the D on both sides. Uh, yeah, like the that's why the method would no longer work. But the sort of deeper reason is that, like, okay, let's say that in the regular algebra problem, we no longer have a D guarantee that D was non-zero, right? Then the zeroness could either come from here, uh, so then the zeroness could come from here rather than from here. And then the, there's just no more guarantee that B minus C has got to be equal zero, you see? And similarly, what that means for the linear algebra case is that D, if, if you don't have the guarantee that D is... Sorry, did I write invert? Uh, sorry. If you don't have the guarantee that D is invertible, then the quote-unquote zeroness could come from the D. Or I think we would rather say that like the um, the null space is non-zero or something like that. Um, sorry, the, the, uh, I forget exactly the right terminology because it's a little bit weird because it's a right multiplication, but hopefully you get the idea. Wait, because it's a right multiplication? What do you mean? Uh, yeah, I, I forget if it, like, I forget if the terminal, because D is, sorry, this is a situation where I just forget, like, if there's some special terminology. Because um, D is on the right here. I'm not sure, l l like, let me put it this way. If you had D times X, right, you would talk about the null space or, like, the image. But the fact that D is sort of to the, to the right. I, I forget if the terminology is a little different. Um, but sorry, anyways, that's not important. Um, the, the, the point is that, like, the, you know, the, <laughs> the intuition is that the zeroness can come from the D rather than the B minus the C. Gotcha. Right? And, and that's not a very rigorous way of saying it, but that's sort of the analog to uh, regular algebra. So far, so good? So far, so good. Okay. Uh, what's the next one? Next one is 18, 2.3. 2.3, 18. Um, oh, yeah, someone asked this one earlier. Um, this one is kind of terrible wording. Like, I, I, I honestly don't know about this one just because the wording is so vague. But it's basically saying if you have a matrix 
a linear transformation A, right? And it maps, it takes, it says Rn into Rn. It's saying then, uh, then there's N pivots. And it all comes down into this word into, which like has, are you familiar with the terms onto or surjection, surjective? Like what word does your textbook use when it, the image is the entire code obeyed, the entire output space? I think it's into and onto, but I don't understand how to use either or. So like into usually doesn't have any special meaning as in my experience. Onto has a very special meaning. Like onto means the entire output space is covered. Right? It means that for any point in the output space, um, for any point in the output space, uh, it, it could get hit by some input under that transformation. Uh, should I like run you through an example real quick? Please. Sure. So let's say that we have an R2 to R2 transformation, okay? Um, and let's say that this transformation is just a 90 degree rotation, right? This is a linear transformation, a 90 degree rotation, um, right? And let's say that it's clockwise. Yeah. So this is basically saying that for any point, uh, you know, for any vector that kind of goes over here, right? The transformation, or let's say any point over here, point vector, kind of the same thing in this context, right? It gets mapped to like this point because it just gets rotated 90 degrees. Yeah. It gets rotated yeah. 90 degrees and then it becomes this thing. So I'm claiming that this space, that this, uh, transformation, let's call this transformation B. I'm saying that this is onto because any point in the output space, any point you care to dream of at all in this two-dimensional space gets hit by something from the input space, right? Namely, it gets hit by the... So, like, if you gave me any arbitrary point uh, Y in the output space, I would say that, well, it would get hit... There exists some X such that bx is equal to y. Uh, so I'm going to say for every y, this is the quantifier that stands, that means for every. For every, for every y, there exists x such that bx is equal to y. Uh, you all are, are you all familiar with quantifiers? Uh, no. Okay, uh, then, then I'll just use plain English. Uh, for every y in the output space, there exists, and this is just plain English, right? There exists an x such that bx is equal to y. Do you believe this? It's basically yes. saying, okay, any output space y, sorry, any point in the output space, well, let me just reverse engineer this linear transformation. So instead of the transformation being 90 degrees clockwise, if I'm reverse engineering it, it's going to be 90 degrees counterclockwise, right? So let's just think about 90 degrees counterclockwise. Then a point kind of like over here would, you know, 90 degrees map onto Y. So I would call this my X. You see that? Yeah. So this is an example of something that's onto, which means the, uh, the entire, the image, you know, the, the span of the, uh, of the transformation covers the entire output space R2. Now let's think of an example that's not on two. I'll give you something really stupid, right? It's still the transformation that goes from R2 to R2, but now the transformation is C is just the zero matrix. <laughs> stupid as possible thing, right? But it works. Any, any input, doesn't matter where, any input just get, gets mapped to a big fat zero. And notably, any point that's non-zero just doesn't get mapped to at all. So this is not on two. 
any point that isn't zero doesn't get mapped onto at all. Yeah, because if the if the transformation in this particular case is c is equal to all zeros, right? Um, if you gave me y was equal to one, one, can you find me an x such that zero 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 x one x two is equal to one one? No. Th exactly. No. There's no such x one x two that that you know because it, it just gets zeroed out. A any x one x two you care to give me when multiplied by all zeros cannot give you a one one. Yeah. So this is basically this transformation is basically saying every single input is getting mapped to zero, and nothing gets mapped to any other point. So this is not yeah. one two. Uh, this is kind of a lame example, right? Because this is <laughs> like this is the point at which someone listening to me would roll their eyes and say, "Okay, can you give us an example that like doesn't suck?" Uh, and well, any example with a you know with a non-empty kernel space would be a sufficient example. But uh, you know, I will. Uh, Uh, so, like, let me give you another example. If all those same points on the left side mapped onto one specific vector, always, 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 then it would be uh, not onto. Yeah. Correct. Right? It doesn't hit everything. Here, I'll give you another example, right? A slightly less trivial example. So, now I'm going to say it's still R2 to R2. But now let's say that C is just equal to 1, 0, 0, 0. Right? This is basically just saying that uh, this transformation basically just is the projection onto the x-axis. Because for any... When you multiply C by any, uh, like, x1 and x2, uh, this basically just kills the x2 part. Right? So this transformation basically looks like uh, if this is the input, it uh, it maps these to it maps it like this, right? It basically just squashes it down to the x-axis. It kills the y component. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. So this one at least can map to anything on the x-axis, right? But it can't map to anything off the x-axis. There's no way to reach a point over here, for example. So we would also say that this transformation is not onto. Seem reasonable? Seems reasonable. So now we bring us back to this question. Like, what the hell does into mean? Um, like, if I was saying this colloquially to... Um, you know, to like a math friend, right? Into is not a special term in my mind. Into would just mean that, you know, the input spaces are in and the output spaces are in, and I'm not making any claims about whether or not it's onto. And if that's the case, well, if we have no guarantee that it's onto, or like anything at all, right? Like, like it's stupid. It all comes down to what the hell this word means. If it doesn't mean anything, then the problem, then the problem is barely giving us anything at all, right? If a linear transformation A maps Rn to Rn, then A has n positive pivot. Sorry, then there are n pivots. Well, if into doesn't mean anything at all, then this implication is, well, I'll let you decide for yourself, right? But it's basically giving us nothing at all and trying to come up with a very strong conclusion. Maybe go find a counterexample, right? Like any of the not on twos yeah. can serve as an adequate counterexample. But if into really means onto, which again, I just hate that this feels so ambiguous, uh, then if it really does mean onto, then you need to look at one of your theorems that connects, um, you know, in that connects onto ness to the number of pivots or the rank 
or something like that. Do you know what a bijection is yet? I have not heard of what a that's fine. That's fine. Is. That's fine. Sorry. Uh, have you heard about one to one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's like uh, one output type thing. One input. One output. Uh, other way I think around. How I tried. Other way around. Uh, so if it's a function at all, what like an input must be uniquely mapped to uh, one output. Uh, one to one means uniqueness, unique mappings, right? So I'll give you an example of a non-unique mapping. This is not one to one because two different points in the domain map to the same point in the range, right? So if you have this guarantee that this never happens, then it's one to one. This point maps somewhere else. Gotcha. But if it's understood that this means onto, then try to look for a theorem that connects um, you know, a linear transformation being onto and the number of pivots. It it should be one of your theorems. Yeah, sorry. I, I you know, I don't know the exact terminology or phrasing your book uses that this problem all comes down to that. Okay. Okay, moving on. What's next? Here. Uh, going to 3.1 37. 37. Okay, so we're talking about determinants now, right? Yeah. So it's asking about uh, 3, 4, 1, 2. And now it's asking, okay, so this is A. And now it's asking about 5A, uh, or I guess rather 5 determinant of A times the determinant of 5A. So you could explicitly calculate this for yourself, right? Um, but I'm not going to do the computation for you. You could just keep your head down and just compute everything and get the answer without even thinking about it by just going through and plugging and chugging with the determinant formula. But let me tell you about how to think about the problem and come up with an answer without doing any math. Well, without doing any computation. So... Intuitively, what is your understanding of what a determinant is? Do you have any uh, intuition about what a determinant is? No. I mean, I only knew of what a determinant was from differential equations, and it had nothing to do with what linear algebra was talking about. Okay. Uh, a determinant is a pretty important and deep concept. Um, and... It's like sometimes so abstract, right? Like, why are you multiplying the diagonals and subtracting one from the other? Right? It's sometimes presented in this very mysterious way. And, oh, sorry, I realized my screen was being blocked, but it's, you know, it's not that important. Um, there is a very good geometric uh, interpretation or intuition for what a determinant is. And it's funny that this never seems to get shared in a linear algebra class because it makes things click a lot easier, in my opinion. But the determinant is essentially how much the volume or area gets scaled. Let me uh, let me see if I can motivate that for you. That, that's actually a good point because, okay, yeah. Yeah. No, keep going. Yeah, yeah sure. So let's say that we have an input vector uh, and it's just like one, one. Right, one comma one, uh, and let's say that you know this kind of represents represents, so to speak, a rectangle where the other corner is at zero zero, or I guess it's really a more precisely a square, right? So one one, you know, the origin is at zero zero, and the other point is at one comma one, and this kind of specifies a square or a rectangle just by telling you what the opposite diagonal is. Okay, mm. so this particular area is equal to uh, one, and then uh, you know, this ve column vector can just be thought of it as one one, right? Now let's think about applying a linear transformation uh, that looks like this. Let's say 
So linear transformation A is equal to 2001. Uh, real quick, off the top of your head, what's the determinant of this? Let me call this A1, okay? What's the determinant of A1? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say two, but that doesn't yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. It, it, it's pretty simple, right? Just multiply the diagonal and then subtract the other diagonal, which happens to be zero. Um, so it's just two. All right, but let's think about what this is doing. Um, this linear transformation that uh, you know gets applied to. So we said that this is sort of represented by the column vector 1, 1, right? So applying it to the column vector 1, 1, we now get 2, comma, two, two. 1. And this basically looks like... Um, okay, the height is still the same, but now the like width is longer, right? So whereas before we had a square, now we kind of have this elongated rectangle with area two. Yeah? Right. And uh, similarly, if instead of two, we did three, I'm just going to rewrite it everywhere, right? Three, zero, zero, one, the determinant would be three, right? And then the resulting vector would be three, one. And now it would look something like uh, something like that with area three now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now let me give you just a little bit more context here. So like a two, if instead I did made this like three, zero, zero, two, so that three, zero, zero, two times one, one would get sent to three, two. And, well, what's the determinant of this thing? That's 6. And what's the area of the rectangle going to be? 6. Yeah. 3 by 2, right? It's taking this, like, sending th this vector that was 1, 1, and now it's sending it to 3, 2. So you can kind of see that for this very simple uh, style of linear transformation that, you know, only populates the main diagonals, it's basically, the determinant is basically the factor by which the so-called area is being stretched, right? So this isn't a complete proof, but maybe take my word for it, or maybe just build up your intuition as you go along, that even for linear transformations that kind of like rotate or like kind of like shear, the the shape a bit, the determinant is always going to be like how much the um you know the quote unquote original area gets modified by. And do we always assume that the original is one one or no, I mean is it if, I, if I had started this off as two two, right? Then uh then this would have been two two and this would have been uh six two so that the final area would have been uh, 12, right? The final area would have been 12, whereas the original area would have been 4, and that's 12 divided by 4 is still a factor of 3, right? So the, the determinant is how much the linear transformation multiplies the area. Oh. Right? And, and that's you know, a property of the determinant, that's a, sorry, the determinant is a property of the matrix rather than a property of the input vector. You see that? Yeah. And, and okay, uh, one, one little caveat is sometimes you can have negative determinants and that doesn't really impact the, the geometric interpretation of the area, right? If this was, you know, negative three here and the area was negative three, well, then I think that the uh, rectangle just kind of flips direction a little bit but the area is still uh, the area still gets stretched by three. So so this this interpretation doesn't really tell you much about sign, okay? But it's still really useful for telling magnitude. And with me so far? Yeah. And what's really, really nice about this is that it gives us a very intuitive understanding of what invertibility is. Because 
we say that something is, uh, if something is not invertible, right, that's equivalent to saying that the determinant is equal to zero. So what does this mean in the language of our geometric intuition of stretching and shrinking the area? Well, that means that the area gets squashed down to zero. The area gets squashed down to zero. So in these little doodles that I was drawing here before, right? Now let's say that A3 is equal to 3, 0, 0, 0, right? So the determinant of A3 is equal to 0. Now, if we try to apply A3 to a vector, 1, 1, well, now, it ha now with the output is 3, 0. So whereas, whereas the original input was just 1, 1, this gets mapped to 3, uh, 3, 0. There's no more area. It's no longer a two-dimensional square, so to speak. Now it's just a one-dimensional line. That area is gone. That area went to zero because the determinant was zero. And now there's no way to bring this back. You, what, you can't multiply. There's no number you can multiply zero by to get a non-zero area. You see what I mean? Once you collapse yeah. that singularity, once you collapse that singularity, it's done. You can't reverse this. You see that? So basically a zero determinant tells you it's not scalable or it just doesn't scale at all. So a zero determinant is sort of saying that like it gets collapsed by it's sort of saying the area collapses to zero. Okay. Right. So we, okay. And uh, I'm using area here for the two dimensional example, but for three dimensional, it would be volume. And for higher dimensions, there would be a corresponding N dimensional notion of volume. Right. But the idea here is that whereas this two dimensional area gets, it, it gets collapsed down to one dimension. It's never coming back. You see what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah. Like, and, and the one dimensional algebra analogy is if you have some area, little a and multiply that by zero, that's equal to zero. And now there's no number that you can multiply zero by to get to get one, to get the original area of one. Or sorry, to get the original area of A, I guess. Right, there's just no such number as Z to make this true. Make sense? Makes sense, then. Yeah. So hopefully you can keep this idea, geometric intuition of determinant in mind. The determinant is just is sort of this geometric stretching or scaling of whatever area or volume, uh, depending on what dimension you're working with. And it's really useful to keep in mind this idea of invertibility, because if you're sort of if your determinant is zero and you can imagine your linear transformation um, collapsing a dimension, so to speak, you can kind of see that there's no way to undo that. Anyways, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, was, I hope that I hope that that's something you keep in mind for the rest of your course, because I think this is one of the like this is like <laughs> it's almost clickbait. This is that like one weird trick that makes a lot of linear algebra make sense, at least at the freshman level. Um, and it's really weird to me why textbooks don't come right out and say this, because it's such a perfectly nice and good intuition. Uh, I know that at higher levels, some mathematicians kind of don't like the impurity of this. But I think it's very useful for intro students. It certainly made determinant make more sense to me as something more visualizable than just this abstract, like, you know, determinant felt like it was just this weird way to mess around with a matrix. Like, what did it really mean, right? Well, yeah, here's I knew what how it to means. get, I knew how to do it, but I didn't know what it was for. Right, exactly. Right, you 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 were probably even calculating the determinant in high school and just had no idea what the heck this thing was. You know, it it felt like an arbitrary series of steps. But here's why it's important. Anyways, uh, are you feeling okay to move on? Yes. Okay. What's the next one? Four point one forty two. 
4.1. Oh, we're already on 4.1? 42. Uh, is that this one? The span thing? Yeah. Okay, so here's what I'm not thrilled by. I don't know what the definition of... I don't know what this plus sign means in the context of span. Um, is span understood to be a number, like representing the dimension? Or is span yeah. understood to... It is? It's the dimension, yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I was thinking that span was the the set of the like image covered by it. But if it's understood that span is literally the just the dimension, right? This basically is asking you to show that the dimension of all the U's plus the dimension of all the V's is equal to the dimension of all the U's and the V's. Right? The dimension of all the U's and the V's Wait. I guess dimension is what you're calling span. Yeah. Yeah, the dimension the of the of image. The plus... Okay. Right. No, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Uh, th this can't be quite right. Um, because if the U's and the V's are exactly the same thing, right? Putting them together doesn't shouldn't increase the dimensionality at all. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so I think that there has to be a I, I think we must be misunderstanding exactly what they mean by this span. I don't think it's just a number. I think it's supposed to under I, it's understood to be the the set of the output, so the, the 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 actual set of the image. And I think it's understood that this plus sign is supposed to be the the union rather than like straight up adding. Uh, something about this question doesn't feel quite well defined or precisely defined. Um, it's okay. Can... Yeah, I like. I can tell you like the broad uh, idea here, and maybe let the viewer try to look up in their textbook what exactly, what precisely it's trying to ask. But I mean, it, like the idea. I mean, gosh, it's kind of hard to read. But the idea here is basically saying that um, like the two spans put together should be the span of all the vectors, right? I think that's what it's trying to say. So like four vectors and then another four vectors should get you the span of eight vectors? Um, like... Yes, but it's also saying that if there's some redundancy involved, then it all works out just right. So let me give you a 3D example, right? Let me tell you how things ought to work three in 3D. Let's say that X, Y, and Z, yeah? So let's say that U1, uh, U1 is equal to X, U2 is equal to Y, and then V1 is equal to Y, and then V2 is equal to Z. So there is a bit of redundancy here. Right? They both have Y there. In this case, the span of the span of U uh U one and just U two is gonna be is gonna be the XY plane, right? Whereas the span of V one and V two is gonna be the the YZ plane. Uh, I drew that poorly. The YZ plane, right? And it's sort of like saying the, you know, if you put... See, the plus sign is getting kind of weird. Because it's sort of like saying if you, like, 
combine the spans of these two planes, that's equal to the span of X, Y, and Z to begin with. You see, that's sort of what the problem is getting at. But like something about this just feels very poorly defined to me. Like what I don't think H and K are literally numbers. Like, do you see the issue here? If they were literally just numbers, if they were literally just numbers, then this would be two and this would be two. But the span of all three of these things would be three. And two plus two is not equal to three. You see the issue? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, like wh what the hell do they exactly mean by uh, span? Because, yeah. Okay. So, Oh, sorry. Was I blocking this thing? Ah, uh, damn it. I keep messing Not around with the way. screen. Huh? Yeah, no all the way, though. You were fine. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. The So, like, the span of, like, let's R1, where it had one vector, and then it was another span with in two dimensions. Are they saying that if you add those two dimensions together, that you would get into the third dimension? Or that doesn't work that way? Hmm. Well, there's no... Okay, so you're basically saying if u1 is equal to x, u2 is y, and then v1 is z, right? If there's no redundancy between these, then it's perfect. Then there's no issue. But if, you know, th there's no issue with the interpretation of span as just the number of the dimension. But if there is redundancy, that redundancy does not get captured when you reduce it to just a number. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, let's be even stupider, right? Let's be just like u1 is equal to x and then v1 is equal to x. Right? In that case, span of u1 is 1, span of v1 is 1, but 1 plus 1 is not equal to the span of, well, if you put u1 and v1 together, that doesn't get you anything extra. It still just gives you one dimension. So you see the issue? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. Do you think it'd be worth in your textbook to look up what exactly defines span as? Because this is... I, I, I am not thrilled about this textbook's notation. I'm going to be honest with you. What chapter is this? Uh, this is chapter four. But span, I think, was in one or two. Span? Two. It was pretty early. Yeah. Look it up. See if they define it. Oh, God, but this PDF lo loads so slowly for me. Um, you think it defined it as early as chapter one? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What do you want to do? Do you want to look uh, it up or do you want to move on? Let's move on. Okay, sure. Yeah. All right. What's the, what next? Let's do 4.2 number 16. Yeah. This is kind of weird. Um, I think I understand what they're saying with this. It's basically saying that if you have a matrix A um, and then you have like a, a bunch of uh, variables, so you know, you have like A, you have A X is equal to B, right? And it's saying that B looks like, well, sorry, this B is like the vector B that they usually use in linear algebra. Uh, but that's different from the little b in this particular problem, which is just a free variable. b minus c, 2b plus c plus d, 5c minus 4d, and uh, d. I mean, do you want me to rename this b to like z instead? But they're basically just calling that vector uh, a variable. Uh, yeah, that's sort of like your output variable, right? So then if your input variables look kind of like B, C, and uh, D. I think it's basically asking you... Um... 
you know, it strikes me that the dimension is a little bit ambiguous. Um, B, C, and D real. Okay. So it, it, it just felt a little bit weird to me because there's no A, but I think it's understood that X is supposed to be a three dimension null vector. So B, C, and D, right? And this is basically saying, all right, based on knowing this and knowing this, just kind of reverse engineer what A has got to be. You see that? And this yeah. you should be able to do, right? You should just be able to see like, okay, like fill in the, the like fill in the blanks basically. Uh, right? So the A ought to be a four by three vector, I think, four by three. And then just, all right, B times C times D. How do you get, what do these three things need to be in order to get you B minus C, right? And then what does the next uh, row need to be in order to get you two B, C, and D? Okay. Yeah, I think that's all it's saying, right? It's just sort of reverse engineering that uh, what A's got to be. I don't think it's anything crazy. Uh, yeah, I think someone else was also asking about... Someone was asking about one other problem. Which one was it? Ah, there was this thing about a subspace that someone was asking me about. Did you uh, feel comfortable with that problem? Uh, do you remember which problem exactly it was? Yeah, I think it was 31. The polynomials of degree 2 or less are a subspace of the polynomials of degree 3 or less. Yeah, we did that one. If you know, uh, if you think you can explain it pretty well, because I mean, I, I don't, I was kind of guessing. I, I just mean, figured I'd do one question from each section. Sure. Uh, no, this problem, so show that uh, I guess P2 is subspace. So when we say sub subspace, we're always talking about linear subspace of P3. So polynomials of degree two uh, or less means like zero or one or two. So, so like f of x is equal to zero or one or two, or like x or like five x or like x squared or like three x squared minus two x uh, plus two, right? This is what P2 means. It, it means like all of these things and like, these are just examples, right? Lip, including but limited not including but not limited to these right it basically means any polynomial we can conceive of uh with comprised is sorry comprised of constants x and x squared terms and then p3 is basically you know something similar but up to x cubed terms okay so there's a couple things you need to prove with a subspace. I think one of them is pretty clear. The fact that P2 is a subset of P3 uh, in the sense that every single uh, f of x is included in this set, right? Because a polynomial of no more than degree 2 is automatically also a polynomial of no more than degree 3, right? Polynomial degree. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's true just by definition. You know, if I gave you 3x squared minus 2x plus 2 and asked you, is this in P3? Your answer should automatically be yes because, um, well, because I just told you it's in P2. Um, <laughs> sorry, I realize that's circular logic, but like every, the fact that it's in P2 means that it doesn't have anything more than degree 2 which means that it doesn't have anything more than degree three. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So then after this, you just got to show a couple of, uh, a couple of things, right? I think you need to show that the zero vector is included, uh, or, or, or sorry, the zero element rather is included in each. Sorry, is included in P2, which it is, right? The zero element just being the constant function zero. So I, th I think you need to show uh, this 
sorry, show that the zero vector is included. I'm just doing like a checklist. Uh, what else do you need to show? And then I think you need to show all the properties of linearity. And, uh, and uh, also closure. Um, yeah, these are kind of the same thing, actually. Uh, so linearity, you basically need to show that for any fx, or I guess f1x and f2x, that are elements that are inside P2, I think you need to show that A times F1 of X plus B times F2 of X is still inside P2, right? This is basically saying that, okay, if I take some degree two or less polynomials and multiply them by a scalar constant A or a scalar and a scalar constant B and add them up, it's not suddenly going to have any degree three terms or higher. That's what that's saying, right? It's saying that it sticks within the degree two polynomials. That's what I mean by closure. If you take two elements of a set and add them together, do they stay in the set? If yes, then we say that it's closed under addition. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so go into your textbook and... Uh, and uh, you know, check to make sure that these are all the criteria you have. You know, the textbook might li list these as two separate things, like verify that f1 of x plus f2 of x is in P2, and then separately verify that a times f of x is in P2. But hopefully you can see why proving these two things is the same thing as proving this one thing. It's just sort of breaking it into two chunks instead. Um, yeah. I think that's everything you need with uh, sub to prove a subspace, but go double check in your book. But it's basically, so this is basically the linearity condition. Uh, this is just like some definitional thing you need to make sure of. And then showing that, uh, and then you also need to prove that it's a subset. And I think you should be good. <laughs> I feel like I'm missing something, but go double check in your textbook. But okay, um, anyways, uh, let me just get to like the brass stacks and like the, the deeper thing, right? Um, we're sort of saying that the why we care about linear subspaces is that we're saying that we care about cases where something is a subset of another thing, but that subset still has some like self contained properties. Does that make sense? Like, let me give you a counter. Yeah. It's always good to ask to yourself, like, okay, this linearity thing seems really like obvious. And like the fact that it's closed under addition, um, can you give me an example where it's not closed? And to that, I'll say, all right, what about all P2 polynomials with odd coefficient? Is this a subspace of P3? Or not? Separate stuff. Is this a odd? Sorry, is this a subspace or not? What do you think? Can you uh, move the Discord over a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, dude, you should have told me. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. Go. I didn't realize that it was being cut off. I need to get better about this. It wasn't the whole time. It was just while you were starting the new thing. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, so is number two a subspace of number three? It should be, right? Well, number two with odd coefficients. So what I mean by this is all the polynomials that look like maybe 3x squared plus 5x plus 7, or pl maybe let's do plus 1, right? All the odd polynomials of degree at most 2, do these constitute a subspace? It should, right? Hmm. The issue is, if you add this thing to itself, right? If you add this thing to itself, what do you get? You get 6x squared plus 10x plus 2. Suddenly, if you add it to itself, it becomes even coefficients, which means that 
you add two things inside the set together, or rather one thing to itself, and suddenly the result is out of the set. So in fact, it fails this condition, where adding two members together manages to jump out of the set. You see that? I, uh, yeah. you know, replace this with P2 odd coefficients uh, for the sake of this follow-up example. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, it keeps getting cut off. <laughs> yeah, 3x squared plus 5x plus 1. It's because uh, I'm also writing down as you're going, so... Gotcha. But, like, if verbally, are you following along when I, like, yeah. explicitly say everything? That's good. But, yeah, so, like, you have cases where things, you know, don't have that closure property. Uh, this one you actually could have said right away because this one does not contain zero. Right? The odd coefficients preclude zero. So, by definition, you actually can say right away it's not a subspace. But what about P2 with even coefficients? What is that a subspace? It shouldn't be then, because you're also cutting off the other ones. I think so. Uh, I think it's an even coefficient if you restrict A and B to be integers. Which, now that I think about it, I'm not actually sure whether or not you're allowed to do that. Hmm. Actually, I'm not sure. I I'm not sure if you are allowed or not. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. M maybe forget about that example. Because um, usually A and B are taken to be scalars. Uh, but it should be clear at least why the uh, odds are not a subspace, even if I'm not totally sure about the evens. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah, let's. Uh, anything else, or shall we call it there? I think we're good there. Okay. Well, I guess that's all for that. All for now. I'll stop recording there. Oh no! Don't tell me. What happened?